It's like, how do you, how do you listen more? Stop talking. What are some ways that we can show people the value we offer to shift the focus from being about pricing? Pricing to me is always a, is always a bad... Like whenever you're trying to compete on price, it's always a bad strategy because it's for most people it's going to be a race to the bottom. Um, so for me, you know, I, I immediately go to the sales matrix as the best way to demonstrate value. Uh, and the sales matrix isn't just a sales tool, it's also a marketing tool. And the more sales matrix that you take people through, the more data that you have to use in your marketing. And for me, you know, value is not determined by the problem, value is determined by the cost of the problem. Um, value is determined by the impact of those problems that you have. And so for me, the way that you stop competing, because that's essentially the, the question, right? Isn't yeah, it? shifting focus away shifting from Shifting focus pricing. away from price onto value. It's understanding the values of your market. And every single one of you, you should understand this. You have what's called, you have market values, which are going to be the general values that you see in your marketplace. And then you're going to have individual values. And there's going to be patterns. But what you will typically notice is your market will have patterns of values. And it's your role to be able to identify what they are, you know, through the communication and the, and, the, and the sale and the transaction of your product. And the more you understand around your market, the more you start to understand their problems. The more you start to understand their problems, the more you start to understand the value of those problems. The co sorry, the cost of those problems. The impact of those problems. And then when you start to add all these things up, you start to realize the value of a solution. Because the value of the solution is not just about based on price. You know, from what it costs, it's also based on what is the benefit. It's also based on the, the, the problems that you're alleviating and the benefits of alleviating those problems. And so for me, the more you understand around what's happening in your market, the easier it is for you to understand your value proposition. Most people who struggle with pricing, they don't understand value proposition. And value proposition isn't about what's, how do I charge for what I have. It's about how much do you understand about the values of your market. And the values of your market are what are the things that are important to them. And the more you understand around what's important to your market, the easier it is for you, and you understand the cost of their problems. You understand the impact of their problems. The easier it is for you to not only price, but position. To me, pricing should always come last. It's always about positioning. And when you've got a strong position, okay, and you've got a strong value proposition that is linked to a strong brand, in most cases, pricing is irrelevant. In most, and I'll say that honestly, in most casing, pr cases, prices, pricing is irrelevant. And the reason that most cases prices are relevant, it is only becomes ir pricing only becomes relevant when there's not a strong value proposition. Because if you can solve someone's problem and the cost of your solution it doesn't radically exceed the value, of, sorry, if the cost of the solution you know, is in line with the value of the problem, then to me, it's, it's not about price, it's about value. And if those two, if those two numbers align, it's a no-brainer. You know, the challenge then is being able to communicate that in a way where people actually believe you. How do you do that? You build a brand. How do you build a brand? Well, that's why we're creating market trust. And how do you create market trust? By publishing content on a regular basis that is actually really helpful, okay? By actually providing utility information on a regular basis that actually is genuinely helpful without people actually having to transact with you. You know, one of the reasons right now that we are experiencing the level of success that we are is we just give so much away. Like, we give so much away for free, that there is in 99.9% you know, .9 of cases, there is no question when people come to us about the value proposition. They trust that the value is there because we've built that trust through brand equity. Does this make sense? Like, and this is a lot of, I think, and I think every single person in this room could get a lesson in the importance of social media when it comes to value proposition. And because the social media, the, the value proposition isn't built in selling. The value proposition isn't built in marketing. The value proposition today is built in your social media profile. It's built in your social media presence. And if you can't demonstrate value through your social media presence, then people will question value. And, and so to me, you know, there's, there's a few answers there, but the number one is you know, build, a, build brand equity through the publication of utility content that builds an inherent trust through the process of delivering that information, demonstrate your understanding of the problems of the market Okay, demonstrate your understanding of the cost of those problems in the market and demonstrate your understanding of the impacts or the other surrounding impacts that, it may, that those problems might have on the individuals who own those problems. And then as a result of that, you create high levels of understanding as well as you know, high levels of trust and connection. And then the next step there is just having the right promotion to drop in at the right time at the right sequence so that you know, they end up transacting with you and becoming a client. Nice. That actually transitions really well into the next <coughs> question, which is from Craig, hey, who Craig. asks... How do you respond to negative posts on your social media? I ignore them. I ignore them. First, I look at them, and then I type out a punch-in-the-face response. 
And then I delete my punch in the face response and I just say namaste, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, it's interesting because, and, and Mati- oh, I wish Matthias was here because we've been through this uh, a few times. You know, I, I, I've, I, um, I've had an interesting relationship with trolls. 99.999% of the time, just ignore them because whatever you pay attention to expands. And I've seen this first time whenever I bite on a troll, it, it's like a feeding frenzy for them. And so for me, I just ignore it and I just focus, you know, I focus on, uh, on the good feedback. I, and, and, the, and what's really interesting for us at the scale that we're at, with the number of engagements that we get, like just to give you context, you know, uh, and this is quite extraordinary when you consider it. Um, I'll just bring this up really quickly. <coughs> so just in the last, okay, so just in the last seven days, we've had over half a million in- engagements just on Facebook. Um, and we could probably count on, one, on, on maybe less than one hand uh, how many have been negative. So literally 99.99999% of our interactions are very highly positive. And so as a result, there's no real need to focus on the negative. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. You know, I'm, I'm actually, like I'm hypersensory, which means I feel things and I actually feel feedback. Although someone can sit there and bore me out and I know it's not true, I'll still feel it. I'm still human. I just have to, I just regulate it in a different way and I perhaps don't do it overtly so people see me getting offended. And most of the times I'm being offended on the inside and I'm just regulating my psychology and my biochemistry quite quickly so that it doesn't actually manifest on the outside. Does this make sense? Uh, whereas once upon a time, you know, it would have manifested with me, you know, wanting to, you know, perhaps tell them who's who, but, you know, you can't help everyone. And, oh gosh, and there's so many people that I've actually turned around, like where they'll, they'll, they'll have a spray and I'll just respond sometimes and say, thank you so much for your perspective. I actually really appreciate it. I wish you nothing but love and all the best. And uh, got to be at least 30 to 40% of the time, people will come back and say, well, you're not actually a dick after all. I actually kind of, that was a really nice response. Thank you. Or I really appreciate that you took the time. You know, I may not like what you have to say, but I really appreciate you took the time to actually respond to me. Thank you. Uh, So yeah, kill them with kindness. Valentina asks, (coughs) uh, how do you get rid of nervousness um, when public speaking? Um, Practice. Exposure therapy. Uh, how, do you get, how do you build confidence? How do you overcome anxiousness? Uh, in any scenario, it's exposure. You know, exposure therapy to me is the cure for everything. Like, you know, h- how do I get confidence speaking to women? You know, practice. You know, how do I get confidence speaking to men? Practice. How do I, you know, get better at, you know, dealing with heights? Jump out of a plane a hundred times. Like, the more you expose yourself to the stimulus, okay, the easier it is for you to regulate the stimulus. But the cool thing is, is you guys have a set of tools that enable you to be able to regulate at a much higher level than most people would unconsciously. Because most people, when they regulate unconsciously, they just do whatever their body has been trained to do by their parents. And most people don't know how to regulate in effective or efficient ways. Most people, you know, it takes them time to regulate. Whereas with you know, the strategies that we've taught you, the psychology, the, physio- the, phys- you know, the physiological, the, the, the stress, the processes that you guys have, you literally should be able to regulate you know, in a matter of, depending on the level of practice, between minutes uh, and in some cases seconds. But you n- you're never going to bypass overcoming a fear of anything by not actually exposing yourself mm-hmm. to the stimulus repeatedly, consistently, with frequency and intensity over time. So there's no magic pill. Emily Vernon asks, how do you stop your head overriding your heart? Mm. Well, that's, to me, that's, that's an intuitive question. Like, mm. that's, how do I not let my brain get in the way? So, for me, it's, it's, it's probably like a, I would refer to my previous answers, which is meditation. Okay, so clear the mind so we can tell the difference between what's mind chatter uh, and what's actually heartfelt intent. Because when your mind is clear, you'll be able to distinguish between, you know, what's mental noise um, and what's just, you know, uh, what's actually pure for me that's coming through. And I think, you know, we find our purity in silence. I hope I get this right in terms of the pronunciation. Um, Guy Como um, asks, how can you improve your energy management throughout the day in order to have enough energy for your family at night time? Intermittent fasting. So again, I am the ultimate hacker. So intermittent fasting has been the game changer for me. Without intermittent fasting, I wouldn't have the levels of energy that I have that enable me to not only be, you know, the businessman that I am, to be the leader I am with the team, uh, because leadership's high energy, you know, (laughs) because when you're a leader, everyone's problems are your fucking problems. Like right now, like we're 40 people, 38, 36, 30, I don't know. We've got a fucking lot of people, right? Um, But what you've got to understand when you're a leader Every single person in your organization, every problem that they have is yours. Because whatever affects them 
affects their role, which affects you. And so no longer are you sitting there with your own problems. You now carry your own problems and you carry the problems of 20, 30, 40, two, three other people as well. And so that requires an enormous level of energy. And, and, and so for me to do that, like I'm literally constantly thinking about the ways that I can amplify and maximize my energy. So for me, intermittent fasting, um, you know, and this year has been a very big game. I've been doing intermittent fasting now two and a half, coming on three years now. Um, but I also eat really clean. I haven't drunk alcohol uh, in 23 weeks now. Uh, so that was another, another thing for me is okay, I need high levels of energy, need high levels of clarity. So I removed alcohol completely from my life. Um, and yeah, I'm just constantly looking at the 1% things that I can do that gives me access to more energy. Um, and even just having a beer on a Friday night, you know, I'd wake up on a Saturday morning, even if I had one or two beers, I'd wake up on a Saturday morning and I wouldn't have as much energy. And I'd wake up on a Sunday morning and I wouldn't have as much energy. And, and I'd notice if I had like two or three beers on a Friday night, it would take two days for it to get out of my system before my energy came back. And so for me, it was like, well, fucking what's the point? Mm. You know, I, and I'm, I don't like alcohol that much anyway. I like a beer, I like the next bloke. But for me, the, the, it's always a matter of priorities. Like what's more important? Having, being able to bounce out of bed at 4.30 a.m. in the morning to be able to play with Noah for like 20 hours. Uh, man, this kid, you've seen the energy, have you seen the energy this kid's got? Like, for f sake, like, <laughs> I thought I was a high, like, this kid, he does not stop moving. Like, he literally does not stop moving. Like, he doesn't, he does not know how to sit still. Even when he's sleeping, he's fucking moving. Like, he doesn't stop moving. And so, for me, I, ha I want to keep up with that. And so, you know, for me, intermittent fasting has been a, an eating very, very clean, apart from eating in the dark. Um, <laughs> As we can find, you know, removing alcohol from my from my system, uh, meditation. Oh my God, energy that you get from you know, uh, twenty minutes of deep te deep meditation is equivalent to three to four hours of deep REM sleep. You know that in itself. You know, you've got to understand the the biological, physiological, uh, the neurological impacts of that energetically are profound. Um, you know, great supplementation. You know, I'm. I'm I'm very lucky to work with a great. You know, the great Dr. Dr. Kylie. And for those of you who, you know are interested in learning how to optimize yourself, you know, you should be getting blood tests, you know, every three to six months and you should be looking at your levels and you should be optimizing your nutrition and optimizing your supplement. Like that's, again, that's, I'm obsessive. And so for me, you know, I go to the small details. I, I don't do things by halves. You know, my training is an enormous part of my energy routine now. Like I'm training, you know, I initially got back to three days a week. I'm now pushing into four days a week with my training and I'm constantly pushing through with the barriers with that. So for me, yeah, it's just constantly looking for the little things that give me access to a little bit more and, yeah, they're the things that I use. Go the one percent man. The one percent man. Uh, another anonymous uh, asks, <laughs> any tips on breaking up with friends? No particular issue or argument. Just no longer someone I want in my head and don't want them around. Uh, look, I guess it depends on proximity, how much time you spend you spend with that individual. Um, for me, the way I've broken up with friends in the past, I've done this twice now. Uh, the last time was when I was walking across the Story Bridge in Brisbane. Um, which was, uh, it was a couple of weeks after one of my friends had been shot dead on the door of a nightclub. Uh, and I had another one that was stabbed in the heart and he died basically in my arms um, on a dance floor. I was working in security at the time and I was involved in a very dark scene. It was a very, um, uh, the scene that was in the time was, um, was, I, was I, I worked in, I was a private security contractor for a number of years. And I used to work in some just absolutely terrible scenarios. Like I'm just talking the worst of the worst. You know, working with incredibly violent people in violent situations. It was like violence was just a regular part of my life at that point, being exposed to violence. Um, and um, I'm very grateful for it. But there was a time where, as I said, I lost two friends in a very short period of time. And I was like, okay, I need to completely disassociate with the crowd that I'm in right now because if I, keep, if I stay where I am, I'm going to end up either dead or in jail. And so it was at that point I, uh, I resigned from my job and after resigning from my job I was walking home across the Story Bridge and I literally had my phone in my hand and I got a text message from one of my friends uh, asking me you know, if I had any drugs. And I remember just looking at my phone and as I looked at my phone, I, asked me, I just literally went and I just threw it off the, the Story Bridge. Uh, two weeks later, uh, I moved out from where I was living and I just never contacted those friends again. Uh, so that's one way that I've done it. The second time that I did it uh, was where, where I just sat down and had some very you know, open and honest conversations. The first time I did it because I think it was what was required based on the scenario then it was quite an extreme scenario. Uh, the second time that I did it was a less extreme. It was more about psychological damage you know, than it was every, than, than, than actual physical threat. Uh, and so I sat down and just, yeah, had some conversations with the, with the friends that I had. And, and 
you know, just, um, you know, essentially we, we all got to the conclusion that um, we were different people uh, and started spending less time together. I didn't actually break up with them. I didn't say, you know, <laughs> this is over. It's, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just, you know, we just ex- talked about our differences very <gasps> openly and as a natural consequence of the discussions that happened about talking about our difference openly, uh, we just naturally started to spend less time together. Um, but I think you should audit your friends like you should audit your team. Like I literally sack my team uh, at least once a month in my head, at, at a minimum once a month. And then I ask myself, and Timmy's just like, what the f***? Um, <laughs> but no, this is a great process. Like I sack my team at least once a month in my head and then I ask myself this question, would I hire them back tomorrow? Because that to me is the ultimate base test. And so for me, I think, I think with my friends very much the same way. I was like, okay, if I didn't, you know, if I, if I didn't see this person again ever, would I be okay with that? And that, to me, is a great indication of, you know, what that level of friendship is, I- I- where it's at and all is about. Because sometimes it, you just can't break up with someone because, you know, there's, there's history there. Sometimes there's family, there's blood, there's, uh, there's other relationships and connections. Sometimes it's just a matter of managing proximity. And managing proximity is about managing the time and space, you know, managing the time that you spend and how close you are to them when you are with them. Nice. Giacomo, a man of many questions, but good questions. Um, how do you become a master listener and have a successful relationship with a female auditory partner? <laughs> Tread carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up and listen. <laughs> nice. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know. Like, what, what's, I don't know if there's a better answer than that. Does it make sense? Like, how do you, how do you listen more? Stop talking. You know, uh, how, do you, how do you listen better? L- like, actually listen to hear, not to respond. Um, listen to hear, not to fix. Um, yeah, like just be present. And sometimes that can be a little bit of a challenge, but the best way to do anything is through practice. 